Good morning, everyone. Welcome. And welcome to the live stream. I know you're expecting revelation, but we'll be in 2 Kings chapter 5, which is practically the same thing, except that it's not. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I need. It's a little giggle. 2 Kings chapter 5. We're talking about Elisha. We have dealt with Elijah, moved on to Elisha, and we talked about a good handful of miracles that he worked. And now this may arguably be the most famous, talking about Naaman. So if we look at 2 Kings chapter 5, we'll read down through 14. 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 1, Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master in high favor, because he, by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land. <clears throat> yes, yes. Mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. I skipped the, the most important part of the story. There at the very end of verse 1. Victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. And she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. <clears throat> she said to her mistress, Would that my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent you Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sent word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he's seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes. He sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to meet me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went, or he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word this, pro this prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down, dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So here we have Naaman. He's a Syrian army commander, and the scriptures call him a mighty man of valor, and he becomes uh, leprous. And you might remember this because this is the same title, this man of valor, the same title given to Gideon in Judges chapter 6. And remember, Gideon went and waged war with the, the, the smaller group of men. They kept whittling down, whittling down. So he's a mighty man of valor. Jephthah, also a judge uh, in chapter 11 of Judges. David is called a mighty man of valor, and that's in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Jeroboam, who we've covered, is called a mighty man of valor. That's in 1 Kings chapter 11. And, uh, and then Eliada is also. But this is the only Gentile, the only non-Jew, that is ever called the mighty man of valor, according to David Guzik, who I was using uh, in my studies here. So this is high praise of Naaman. He's a mighty man of valor, but he becomes leprous. And uh, that's essentially a death sentence, as you may recall. You, you're dirty, especially in the Jewish society. You can't stay in town. I don't know that Syrians were any different, that they're like, ew, 
because it's a skin disease. So this mighty man of valor is being brought low by this leprosy. And he's got this Israelite slave girl. So apparently the Syrians have raided before. They're, we'll talk about especially in the upcoming lesson about the wars with Syria. There's kind of constant war because that's right on the northern border, border of the kingdom of Israel. So they're always going back and forth, skirmishing. And once again, we talked about that wartime in this era is we're not only conquering for territory, we're taking people, we're taking all your stuff that's how you get soldiers paid. So anyway, Naaman has an Israelite slave girl, and this girl works for his wife, and she's, oh, if uh, only you were down in Israel, there's a prophet there in Samaria. You could go talk to him. So then Naaman petitions the, his, his boss, the king, and says, yeah, go, go down there. Sends gifts to Jehoram, who is the king at the time, and I really like Jehoram's answer here that uh, in verse 7 that he, he reads the letter and he's like oh, he tears his clothes you know, rips, the, rips his shirt so to speak, says my God to kill and make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy he only consider and see how he's seeking a quarrel with me so Jehoram rightly says I can't do anything about this <laughs> and he's like he wants another war with me and there's nothing I can do but uh, Elisha knows what to do. He's like, no, no, no. Quit tearing your clothes. Quit acting like a child. I'll take care of this. This is well within my scope to be able to handle this. And then Naaman comes with all his entourage and all this gifts that the, the Syrian king sends with him, all this money, gold, changes of clothes. And Elisha comes out and stands before him. Right? No, Mark, that's incorrect. Thank you. <laughs> he sends a servant out. So wherever, <laughs> if it's Elisha's house or whatever, and uh, Naaman's out there standing like a, a mighty general, which he is, and then the servant comes out. And says, hey, my boss says you need to go dunk in the Jordan. <laughs> and Naaman's offended. Uh, this, at this prescription and at the, the disrespect that I got to go wash seven times in the Jordan. This prophet was supposed to come out and meet me. And he was supposed to do mighty deeds. He was supposed to wave his hand and call upon his Lord, the Lord, the God, and, and cure me. And he says, then I got to go dip in this river. Aren't the waters of uh, Damascus superior? But his servants come by, and they're like, Master, if he would have required a mighty deed from you, you know, like uh, some tasks of Hercules, would you not go do them? It's the way, this is my imagination of what they would tell him. And uh, he says, just go dunk in their river. It's pretty easy. And we need to remember about the military at this time, there's no, uh, I don't, there's not like academies <laughs> where you go and you come out as an officer. You rise through the ranks by being really good at war. <laughs> so Naaman is a mighty man of valor. So he is a, probably a brutal warrior. And for these servants to come up and basically say, hey, quit being a baby and go dunk in this river. This is a, a huge deal for a servant to counsel a mighty warrior like this was to put their lives in jeopardy because if he flew off the handle, he was, it was well within his scope and to murder these servants if he felt like it. They're sure that if Elijah would have asked like a mighty deed, well, it's, it's also like Saul did to David when David wanted to marry Michael, who was uh, Saul's daughter. He's like, sure, but I'm going to need uh, 100 Philistine foreskins as the bride price. And David's like, all right. And he went and got them. So that, that's a mighty deed, something like that. Uh, but this is just a simple thing. Go dip in this river. So he dips seven times, and he is healed in verse 14. Oh. 
one of the more interesting things in the story to me is the servant girl. Um, it just kind of mentions her in passing, but you know, she, she's a war captive, basically. She's not, uh, she's a slave. Um, but yet she's still looking out for the welfare of her master, even though she's a slave because Israel sinned and God let these countries around him encroach, but she still has faith in God enough. We don't know how long she's been a slave. Right. We don't know how old she is, but she remembers the power of Elisha and she accepts her circumstance, whether it's her fault or not, and, and she still has, has faith in him, and that's, that's impressive to me. Oh, that's a great point, too. And remember that she's in Syria, so that year of jubilee and the freedom does not apply to her. <laughs> Austin. A couple of things that I thought were interesting. I liked your point about David going and killing the 100 Phil- Philistine men. And in fact, I think in that chapter, we actually read, Saul says, I want 100. David goes and gets 200. And so I think Naaman very well could have done the same thing. I agree. If Elisha had said, go do some great thing, uh, Naaman would say, I'm going to do more than that to you know, prove how good I am. But that's not the point that God's trying to make here. And then the other thing I thought was interesting was in verse 14 when Naaman washed it in the Jordan, it says at the end of the verse, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. You know, if you're an adult man and you're a soldier, your skin probably gets in rough shape over time, but God isn't just healing him back to where he would have been normally. God is making it like all the way good again. And so it's better than it would have been otherwise. Oh, that's, that's that speaks a, to God's power. That's a brilliant point. I hadn't considered that. Yeah, because once you get to be an older person, you... The sun hits right here more, so it's rough, and you've got scars, and, and you're right. Yeah, like the flesh of a little child, pure and smooth. and No, oh, that's, a, that's a brilliant point. So this is truly a miracle. And then this is just uh, something I thought was interesting. This is the Jordan, and this is just south of the Sea of Galilee. So, you know, it's a pretty decent size. creekish water and then we got the Abana river near Damascus so I mean it doesn't look too much better and this photo is from Farrell Jenkins I know some of you know him personally <laughs> I found it on his blog <laughs> go ahead okay uh, when I when I see this I think about people that hear the plan of salvation and go that's too simple or I don't understand the getting wet or this, that, or the other. Jesus said it. If you do it, it will happen, you know, salvation from your sin. And, but they say, no, it's too simple or it's, it's weird or whatever. Or, I don't like this part of it. Just do like the servant told him and obey and you shall get what you're seeking. It is wild, especially since he dipped seven times in the Jordan, and that it's wild that uh, a lot of, I only know American Christians, so they have trouble with baptism, whether, whether it's the necessity of it or the style of how to do it, and they have such problems with it. But we have, and here in this country, if we don't have a, a baptistry, there's clean swimming pools. Our rivers are fairly clean. And if you were here a couple of months ago, you heard Warren from South Africa talking about going into the bush in Zimbabwe and Botswana, and you got to slap the, the creek bed if it's full and try to rouse the crocodiles <laughs> and then post watch so that you can baptize. Uh, Efren Algaba, if you look at his reports, he sends a lot of uh, pictures with his reports. And there's lilies everywhere, or, or plant life in the water, and they clear all that out and go get into this, this creek side, and uh, the same with India. And uh, even in Boston, if you read the reports from Curtis and uh, Kyle up in Boston, they're baptizing sometimes in the Charles River, <laughs> which I understand is cold. I can't, I can't go that far north. It's way too cold for me at any time of the year. <laughs> I'm from here. But anyways, that, it, it shows how, how blessed we are, but that, that American Christians would draw that line in sand. I've been talking to a, a guy at my station for a while about baptism, and he's Baptist. And it's weird that 
a Baptist says that baptism is not necessary for salvation, just God wants you to do it when you get a chance, is essentially what he said. And they're like, how are you dealing with this and that? And, and we, we had good, good long talks, not angry, but it was, it was good. Uh, but that just made me think of that when you're talking about that. It's a simple command. It requires a little bit of humility because you come up sopping wet and it's hard to look like a mighty warrior when you're sopping wet, but here we are. Uh, anyway, that's a good point, obviously, since I went on a long tangent about it. <laughs> Anything else about this part of Naaman? Let's stay in chapter 5, 2 Kings 5, and we'll read down through the rest of the chapter. Verse 15 in 2 Kings 5. Verse 15. Then he returned to the man of the God, man of God, he and all his company. This is Naaman. And he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all of the earth but in Israel. So accept now a present from your servant. But he said, This is uh, Elisha. He said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, if not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any God but the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes to the house of Rimmon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon. When I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. And he said to him, Go in peace. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, See, my master has spared this name in the Syrian and not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi followed Naaman. And when Naaman saw someone running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master sent me to say, There have just now come from come to me from the hill country of Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Pee Good night. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. And Naaman said, Be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied up two talents of silver and two bags, two changes of clothing, and laid them on two of his servants. And they carried them before Gehazi. And when he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and put them in the house. And he sent the men, sent the men away, and they departed. He went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, your servant went nowhere. Verse 26, but he said to him, did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male servants and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper like snow. So Naaman comes back. He's dipped in the Jordan, like Austin said. His flesh is like a, a newborn child, brand new. So he praises God and offers gifts to Elijah. And uh, this is just a, a great instance right here. Elisha refuses because Elisha literally didn't do anything. <laughs> this was 100% the power of God. But Elisha says, you know, whether, however the Lord revealed it to Elisha. It's like, just go dip seven times in the Jordan and you'll be fine. And Elisha didn't even get up from his chair, so to speak. He sent the servant out to say this. So Elisha says, I don't, I don't want any of that stuff you brought. Remember, it's gold and silver and changes of clothes, things like that. And then Naaman says, I will only worship the Lord. He said, I know there is no God in all of the earth except for in Israel. And then when uh, Elisha says, I don't want your money, I don't want your things, he says, all I want then are two mule loads of soil so that I can worship Jehovah on his soil. That, uh, and that is amazing to me. Remember we talked at the end of the Mount Carmel thing how both uh, 
or Jezebel was unmoved. And then Naaman just, oh, I got this dread disease. And I just had to dunk seven times in this river. I come up. And now he is sold. I have seen the power of God. I have seen that this is the only true God. I will worship him only. And hopefully in your Bible, it's got the Lord in all the little caps that, me, that he's talking about Jehovah, the, the God of Israel. I am only going to worship him because he has fixed my skin. He has cured me of this, him alone. I know that that is the God. And he goes, I will not offer a sacrifice to anybody else except for Jehovah. And then he begs for pardon. He's like, but I am a general. <laughs> and my king, if I have to go in with the king to this, this rimen, then please pardon, because I'm not really worshiping. I'm just there because I have to be, <laughs> is the vibe that I get from this. Uh... So I think it's amazing that this Syrian, this Gentile comes in. He has limited exposure. And he's like, this is the God. This is the only God I've seen do anything. He is the true God, and there is no other God before him. And uh, it's amazing. But Gazi, it's like, man, I'm this prophet's servant. This guy's got a literal chariot load of cash. Let's see what I can do. And Naaman starts driving off after Elijah's like, you know, have a good trip, Naaman. And uh, he gets a little ways off. Ozzy sneaks out the back door and he runs up to him. He's like, you know what? We do need just two talents of silver, though. I think that's still like 140 pounds, but still, <laughs> it's a lot, but not compared to all that Naaman had brought with him. Uh, two talents of silver and two changes of clothes. And uh, so Gehazi's just greedy here. Elisha says, we didn't do anything. This is all the Lord. I didn't even go with you to the Jordan River. I don't want anything. Gehazi's like, what? He brought all this. I'm going to get mine. And then he goes and he, he stows this away. And I like the exchange between Elisha and Gehazi. Where have you been? Uh, no, nowhere. Nowhere. That's the answer that I'm giving you. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> uh, it's like, was this a time to accept money and all these other things? Therefore, because of your greed, you get Naaman's leprosy. That is your curse for your greed. You get the leprosy. Any comments? Naaman, Elisha, Gehazi? We'll go off in the name. And then... You know, in some of the other stories about Elisha, we've read about Gehazi actually doing things. I don't think we see that in this one. It says Elisha sent a messenger. I mean, I guess it could have been Gehazi, but we're not told. Right. So I think part of the issue here is Gehazi didn't do anything here. And he's like, you know, this is just an opportunity to make a quick buck. Why didn't my master take any of this stuff? And so I think there's, like you said, some greed involved, and that's why he gets in trouble. Right. And I was just talking to my mom, you know. Gehazi probably wanted it for himself. He came up with this story about, oh, we need it for these... Uh, two other people who just showed up, but he probably wanted it for his own purposes. I agree. Um, interesting thing about Gehazi to me is um, we. It's, this is not the end of Gehazi in Scripture. We're going to come across him in a few chapters later. And sometimes when we do something wrong and we're rightfully punished because of it, you know, we just. He doesn't stop serving Elisha. Elisha doesn't send him away and get rid of him. He continues to be Elisha's servant. And we're going to read where he's actually an emissary to the king mm -hmm. as a leper, which I don't... That's interesting how that works because they're not supposed to be in their presence. But he's going to be an emissary to the king on behalf of Elisha in, in chapter 8 we see about... So Elisha doesn't give up on him just because he did something wrong. Right. Um, and that's... We, we shouldn't give up on each other. Um, and God certainly doesn't give up on us. I assume that uh, Naaman wanted this dirt to, lean, to kneel down on in the. That's my guess. Like temple. I want to. Uh, the thoughts about God. Remember when they talked about uh, Jehovah is just a God of the hills, not of the valleys that the, the picture of gods in these times 
and even all before and some after they're local to this area. So I just wonder what the king of Syria thought about having two piles of dirt. In Maybe his, just put like a planter box temple. up. <laughs> <laughs> but if he was willing to do all that for a name, and I'm sure, he, well, if he wants to kneel on dirt, that's okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. If he's willing to send all those talents of gold, silver, and uh, all these changes of clothes, which was no small feat either, if you'll recall. But yeah, I think that's that's what it is. This that Jehovah is God of this land, I'm going to take some of this land with me so that he will uh, be pleased. I kind of think it's interesting in verse 17, and again, this is kind of underscoring what you talked about being a mighty man of valor as a leper, but he was also a Syrian who had the Israelites in captivity. But he referred Naaman to himself as your servant. And I see that at least twice, yeah, in the same verse. You, you are a Syrian who has the Israelites in captivity you know, and, and you're viewing yourself with great humility. Right. Yeah, and that he recognizes the he recognizes the power of God and that Elisha is his representative, I think. So I, I think you're you're exactly right to point out that that he at at first was not humble at all. Why would I go dip in their dirty river when we have these these rivers where I'm from that are they're supposed to be cold and, and, and uh, pure and stuff like that. And then practices humility, learns humility, and it's like, okay, this is a real, the real God. Any other comments? Excellent comments, everybody. And then the next little bit will be kind of like the before Naaman, if you were here uh, Wednesday, which kind of hitting the high points of these uh, miracles, because... Elisha's account, his, this biography that we have, it's kind of like bullet points. There's these different miracles that occur, and I, I just wanted to look at them like in, uh, we'll be in chapter 6. We've got the axe head. That, uh, verse 2, let us go to the Jordan and each of us get a log. These are the sons of the prophets. And then make us a place to dwell there. And he answered, Go. And then one of them said, Be pleased with the servants, and I will go. So he went with them. They came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But verse 5, As one was felling a log, his axe head fell, axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, Ah, oh, alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. He said, Take it up. And he reached out, of his, he reached out his hand and took it. And I like that this is obviously a miracle, but to, to me, the, the, the part that sticks out is, man, I borrowed that axe and I broke it. <laughs> what am I going to do? My buddy or whatever that I borrowed that axe from, he's going to be furious. He's like, Elisha, the axe that I borrowed, the head fell off and it fell into the Jordan. Can you help me out? He's like, yeah. Where was it? Over here? And he cuts off a stick and he throws it in there. And then the axe head floats up on the top of the water. Reaches out, repairs the axe. Elisha goes, there you go. <laughs> but the borrowed part, that just, I don't know, it just makes me giggle, I guess. That's like something that happened to me. Hey, man, could I borrow that? First swing, the axe head goes flying off in the river. Man! <laughs> it's the kind of life I lead. Stuff breaking. <laughs> And then uh, moving on to the next one. Syria is once again, and like verse 8, it says, Once when the king of Syria was warring, warring against Israel. So like we had talked about with Naaman, Syria is always warring with uh, Israel. Uh, and uh, it's 
go to 11, actually, verse 11. The mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So Israel is holding its own against Syria, and Syria is like, How do they know what we're going to do before we do it? And the servants say, Oh, it's Elisha. They got a prophet down there, and he tells their king the words that you're speaking in private. So he's like the he's like a spy, but remote. <laughs> uh, he's wiretapped your bedroom, and uh, so verse thirteen. Make sure I'm clicking up. And he said, "Go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him." And it was told to him, "Behold, he's in Dothan." So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. So Syria wants to get rid of Elisha. He's, he's telling the king all their, their plans for their defeat. So he's like, if we get rid of Elisha, then we're free to move about the country of Israel. And so he sends the entire army. We're going we're gonna to get rid of this guy. And he's in Dothan, which is in Georgia. Thank you. That's all I needed. It's not in Georgia. <laughs> is it Alabama? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, remember that most of our towns, especially in the south, were pulled from this book that we're reading. So, moving on. 15. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he said, Do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And it looks like this is just Elisha and the servant. So when he says, don't be afraid, you see this entire army, but there's more of us than with them. And then verse 17, then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So you can just imagine the servant. You go out the door to, to get water or whatever it is that he was going out to do, and the entire Syrian army is there to capture Elisha. And he runs back in. He's like, Elisha, the entire army's here. What are we going to do? We're surrounded. And Elisha said, don't worry about this. And then he prays that his eyes may be opened, and he, he sees all of these chariots of fire similar to what was separating Elisha and Elijah when Elijah was taken up. So he sees this army of the Lord surrounding them, protecting them. Let's see. And then verse 18. When the Syrians came against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said, This is not the way, this is not the city. Follow me and I'll bring you to the man that you seek. And he led them to Samaria. And uh, as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O oh Lord, open the eyes of this, these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And as soon as the king of Israel, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? He said, You shall not. Would you strike down those you've taken captive with your sword and bow? And then it goes on. And then at the end of verse 23, the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel because they were so confused at what happened. And I think the key here. Elisha prayed. Elisha prayed. Elisha prayed. He prays for his servant. He prays for the servant again. He prays, uh, prays against sounds mean, but or whatever. But he, he prays about the army of Syria and then leads them back into Samaria. And so I think that is a strong key here for us to remember. That we that James talks about Elisha was a man with a, or Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed and talking about fervent prayer. And I don't think that this is any less fervent here. The power of prayer is shown here that Elisha has a close relationship with God, 
we have a close relationship with God, so we should not neglect prayer. Uh, I think we see over and over again the power of it working. So to tie this back to Naaman, it stands to reason that Naaman's somewhere in this story because he's either probably one of the servants that's talking to the king. He could be the guy that's telling him, hey, there is a prophet named Elisha. He could be here with this group surrounding Dothan. Um, but I mean, it's possible he's somewhere else. But in all likelihood, right. he's relevant somehow to the story. And I'm not sure, sure what, but you wonder what Naaman's thinking, what he's doing, because um, his, his allegiance might be a little torn, because he certainly has a... Ethan pointed out, had high regard for Elisha. Right. Um, but I just, I always wonder about what role he's playing here, if any. No, that's exactly right. And then the other, we don't necessarily, it's not chronological, maybe, or it's, yeah, maybe he's somewhere else. Or he's, like when he talked about, sometimes I'm going to have to go into Rimen and this god of Syria and bow down. Please beg your servant's pardon or something like that. But yeah, I don't, I don't know if he's, he's in the charge. Maybe he begged for a northern assignment. <laughs> Let me go attack whatever they called Turkey or whatever, northern Iraq. Uh, but no, you're right. I, I, there's no way to know. Moving on. Let's go to chapter 8. Second Kings 8. And verse 7, actually we'll go, we'll go all the way down through 15, we'll read this account. Now Elisha came to Damascus. Damascus is well within Syria, so he's outside of Israel. Elisha came to Damascus, Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. When it was told to him, the man of God has come here, the king said to Hazael, take a present with you and go to meet the man of God and inquire of the Lord... That's all the little capitals. So he's talking about Jehovah. Inquired the Lord through him, saying, Shall I recover from this sickness? So Hazael went to meet him and took a present with him, all kinds of goods of Damascus, 40 camel loads. When he came and stood before him, he said, Your son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has sent me to you, saying, Shall I recover from this sickness? Verse 10, Elisha said to him, Go. Say to him, You shall certainly recover, but the Lord has shown me that he will certainly die. Then he fixed his gaze and stared at him until he, until he was embarrassed, and the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why does my Lord weep? And he answered, Because I know the evil that you will do to the people of Israel. You will set, their, set on fire their fortresses. You will kill their young men with the sword and dash in pieces their little ones and rip open their pregnant women. And Hazael said, What is your servant who is but a dog that he should do this great thing? Elisha answered, The Lord has shown me that you are to be king over Syria. Then he departed from Elisha and came to his master who said to him, What did Elisha say to you? And he answered, and he, and he, answered, he told me that you would certainly recover. But the next day he took the bedcloth and dipped it in water and spread it over his face till he died. And Hazael became king in his place. So I included this in our, our talk about Elisha because this is well outside Israel. You know, before he's been uh, doing work in the kingdom of Israel. But God sends him up to Syria, or he's called to Syria, Ben-Hadad. The guy has been attacking Israel over and over again in, in some of the sections that we skip. And he's like, I need to hear what Elisha says about this. So he's sick and he inquires of Elisha. He sends Hazel, Hazel down there to inquire. He says, what do you, what do you think? And uh, he says, tell the king that he's going to recover, but he's definitely going to die. Which seems wild to us. I would, it's, it was interesting to me. And I was like, what? But we'll see what's going to happen. And then Elisha weeps before him. And Hazel's like, what are you doing right now? Why are you crying? And he says, because I know, I see the evil that you will do to my people. 
basically, the people that I am sent to recover for the Lord, you are going to do evil to them. But because the Lord has declared you king of Syria. And I kind of I like Hazel, Hazel's answer there. He's like, am I a dog that I would do these awful things? And he goes, no, you're going to be king. So yeah, you're going to do them. It's like, oh. So it goes back to Damascus. And the king says, what did he say? He goes, oh, he said you're going to get better. And I'm sure Ben-Hadad said, oh, that's nice. Laid down and went to sleep. And then Hazel got this literal wet blanket <laughs> put it right over his face till he quit moving he said I'm king now and it's all the will of the Lord it seems violent which it is uh, but this is the will of the Lord any questions here I think it shows that God is the God everywhere not <laughs> he's not limited to the patch of soil that Naaman took with him <laughs> I love the irony at the beginning of this section. We read in 2 Kings chapter 1 that when King Ahaziah got sick, he went to ask Baals above the god of Ekron, will I get better? And now we have the king of Syria inquiring of Elisha. And so it's just so backward from what you would expect and it reflects really badly <laughs> right. on the kings of Israel at this point. And I just think this whole exchange is really interesting between Elisha and Hazael where you know, Elisha says, go tell him he's going to recover, but he's absolutely not going to recover. And so maybe I'm thinking too much into it, but maybe he would have recovered if Hazael wasn't going to murder him. I, I just don't know what all the context is, and I don't think we're told one way or the other. Right. And then the last thing I thought was interesting was Hazael says in verse 13, what is your servant who is but a dog that he should do this great thing? I don't really like the word great from Hazael because I, I think part of it is, who am I that I'm going to do these awful things? But maybe there's some nationalism. Oh, I'm going to do this? Right. And so I just don't know. I, th I think it's all interesting. Yeah, and that might be a translation thing. Like, it, if you've ever heard of Ivan the Terrible in uh, Russian, that means Ivan the Great. It's all the same. So I, we have terrible as a negative connotation, but it, it, it's like also, I think, like within Joel, when it talks about the great and terrible day of the Lord in the older translations, and it's the great and awesome day of the Lord. So it may be that as a translation is issue, but... I think it's interesting if we're talking about verse 13 there. New King James actually says gross thing. It oh. doesn't say great. And I highly encourage people to, you know, the Bible is its own best commentary. And while we are speaking English and reading English, it's good to kind of compare translations for things that look controversial because sometimes one translation may do it a little bit better. I agree. Yeah, we'll definitely come up with that in the next lesson. Because <laughs> I think every other one except the ESV is a little bit better. <laughs> so back when Elijah is running from Jezebel, and he's on Mount Sinai and, you know, woe is me, that whole episode, God says three things to him. If you remember, he says, I'm going to find your replacement, Elisha. I'm going to destroy the house of Ahab with Jehu. And I'm going to appoint Hazael king of Syria. So this, the last, I don't know, eight, ten chapters, if because it was First Kings was one book originally. Right. It's all about Elisha. And now he's talking a little about Hazael, and then he's going to roll into Jehu. So that's chronologically, these are all scriptures saying, okay, this is how what was told to Elisha is fulfilled. So Hazael is being raised up so that he can come punish Israel for what they're doing to these prophets yes. um, in, in Elijah's day. So that, that's how it's, it's, it's all relevant and why Elisha is, is being tied to him right here. Yes, that is 100% accurate. And we will talk about Jehu on Wednesday uh, because that is well remembered that after, after God lets Elijah collect himself, and he starts giving him assignments, and you're exactly right. I want you to go get Elisha. He's going to help you out. I want you to go to Syria and anoint uh, Hazael. And it's just, this is all the fulfillment, uh, as Aaron points out. Anything else? Chapter 8, because we're going to skip all the way to 13. 2 Kings 13. Very quickly. Now, when, uh, it will be in 14, when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was about to die, he 
Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. And he took a bow and arrows, and then he said to the king of Israel, Draw the bow. And he drew it, and Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands, and he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it and said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria, for you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. He said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with him. And he struck three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him. And he said, you should have struck five or six times. You would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. But now you'll strike down Syria only three times. So Elisha died and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen. And the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. So we have this grand tale of how Elijah died, and Elisha is, so Elisha died and they buried him, much like everybody else, all the kings. And then he died and he was buried, and aren't the rest of his deeds in the Chronicles. Uh, so Elisha's sick, Joash comes up to him, and it's exactly like uh, Elisha says about Elijah in Second Kings 2.12, uh, it says, And Elisha saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. And then this is the same. Joash has high regard for Elisha here. And then Elisha has one last prophecy, one last work to do. He's like, shoot an arrow. And he's like, that is God's victory over Syria. And he hands him like a quiver. Like, and he's like, all right, strike the ground with these. And he... Hits the ground three times. Man, if you would have done it more, you would have won. But now you're only going to win three times. And it talks about that toward the end of the chapter. Uh, He dies and is buried. So I don't know if it's this big giant tomb or if they just found one. And then later on, uh, there's a Moab raid and a guy gets killed and they just pitch him into the grave of Elijah and he comes back to life just from touching the bones of Elisha. So uh, that's his, the last amazing thing from Elisha here. I know that was quick, but is there any, any questions, comments? We will move into the final kings or the, the remaining kings of Israel in the next couple of lessons. It's a lot more than I thought there was going to be. One, Andrew, over here. Please. Sorry to keep talking, but... It's all good. Th- I absolutely love this this last part of the story. It's, there's nothing like it in Scripture to me, but it, it reminds me of how the Hebrew writer talks about Abel, the blood of Abel still speaks. Even after Elisha is dead and buried, and it's his bones, to show Israel that God is was so much with this man, Elisha. I mean, there's only like seven or eight resurrections in all of Scripture. And this is one of them. I think we just gloss over it. And this is significant right. that God is, is demonstrating how much he was with Elisha after he's dead. That, that's fascinating to me. All right. Thanks, everybody.